Hello there, and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga, and this is episode number 414. That's 414 of the Agassino Zynga Show. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. If it's your first time checking out this show via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and of course, turn on the notification bell so you can get updated with all my numerous uploads that I post on this channel. If you're listening via the podcast app, of course, leave me a five-star review and share the show with all your family and friends, especially during the festive period. And if you may, and if you would like to subscribe to my Patreon, you're more than welcome to as well. That's patreon.com, forces Agostino. On my Patreon, you'll find one bonus episode only for Patreon members coming to you this week so make sure you tune in there i'll be talking about a few more um x-rated um not made for youtube topics so if you want to um glean some of my learnings on that i would definitely advise you to head over to patreon.com for slash agostino that's patreon.com for slash a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o you can find a link um tagged down below in the descriptions or in the pinned comments of um this video if you're watching it and um though yeah it only starts at one pound one dollar i've got 100 of those tiers left so make sure you jump on in there and get involved and you know don't be stingy help the kid out Apart from that, still here, still kicking, still breathing, still trying to do the thing, as per usual. Um, what's happened this weekend? Not much really, right? Oh no, of course, there's been a lot happened. Um, we've had an update in tears in the UK. We've obviously been placed in, uh, not in London specifically. We've been placed uh, placed under more stringent lockdown. We've also got this, um, you know, countries all over Europe deciding to block their borders, you know, stop their borders for us, which makes complete sense. Uh, flights being suspended to certain locations standard stuff on that but we're gonna get into that later on um what i get up to the weekend specifically for me for me for me i mentioned i watched the living die in la may not be the lead six two great because we all hate lead scum what else happened this weekend bada 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 bing bada boom bada boom i started to watch this tv series called your honor i recommend you check that out um that's pretty interesting um it stars the guy <clears throat> Is it Brian Cranston, um, the dude from Breaking Bad? He's really good in it. And essentially, the whole premise behind it is um, this kid um, accident. What? Well, so I give the plot away? Yeah, I give it because it's part of the movie. But again, if you don't want any spoilers, then make sure you click X on this video in five, four, three, two, one. So the plot of the TV series is essentially Brian Cranston's son um, gets involved in a hit and run accident where he, un, you know, inadvertently kills um, this kid. The kid happens to be the son of a very powerful mob boss or criminal of, you know, under underlord or whatever, overlord, whatever they called in whatever area that they live in. Um, the Breaking Bad dude's son or the Breaking Bad dude, he's obviously a judge but they're not exactly rich or affluent in any way shape or form they're kind of you know the road middle class people and he's well known to be a little bit of a you know wouldn't say what is he, he he's known to be a little bit charitable in, in the sentencing he gets very invested in the people that he speaks that come into his courtroom he goes out of his way it seems like to be a little bit more lenient to people who come from you know rough neighborhoods and rough backgrounds and then you know as the story kind of evolves he has to kind of you know um he has to push those boundaries and limits that he's willing to do in order to keep his son safe because as we learned in the series unfortunately um his wife and the mother of his child has essentially passed away early so he's left to look after this young teenage kid on his own as he's going through such a traumatic experience like you know inadvertently killing somebody and he's growing up in front of his eyes so it's a pretty cool premise and i love the fact that you know both families are from what you would expect what you'd kind of attribute to well to do you know have pretty good um support systems around them whatever it may be right that that's a judge that guy's a criminal overlord everyone obviously is kissing the ring and making sure that they keep him happy and arrogant because they're scared um the family obviously have some clout and influence in the town there's a lot of kind of clashing things and then of course there's a lot of collateral damage that you basically see as the series goes on but it's really good just the opening sequence alone the first 20 minutes will get you gripped it's a very very strong first um episode i think the, the first two episodes are out i'm pretty sure the third one came out the other day but if you have struggling to watch something i definitely really recommend you check out your honor um what else did i watch um, i finished the undoing that was pretty good 
a um, bit upset about the ending. I thought they would have tried a bit more to really kind of throw you for a loop. I think, you know, in the end, the killer made complete sense, but I would have still preferred all the other threads that they sort of like threw out there, the little bits of bait, um, the little clues. I would have thought, I would have, I would have liked there to be more exploration there. Um, that kind of went nowhere. What I did like about it, which I think was expertly done, was the complete and utter destruction of this woman's life, right? Nicole Kidman's character. Um, you get you see it from the start, right? This very like, you know, super, you know, A type woman, highly intelligent, um, very career driven, but assured, um, a great balance between career and family, which is, you know, something if you watch a lot of these TV things um that center around women is usually a common trope that they kind of struggle to balance the two things which maybe is a um your representative of their kind of real life but in this aspect you see somebody that's very accomplished in their career but also has a very steady um home life and has the extra bonus of having a pretty vibrant sex life it appears like right they have you know they kind of are all over each other like teenagers she's got a really you know um, humorous but parental sort of uh, relationship with her young teenage son um you know she's kind of uh, has a good social group a good social circle that she surrounds herself with where she's you know she's not subordinate to these women but she's also uh very highly valued in that group like very very good right it's all done really really expertly expertly done and then over the, the course of like what is it six episodes her life comes crashing down in really dramatic fashion every single thread gets pulled and i love the fact that even that i, I love it even more that they um nicole kidman's character is extremely wealthy right her family whoever the, the that it gets up to we don't really get to find out in a series but they're extremely wealthy they have all the resources um that you would you would kind of wish for if you ever get put in a situation that she got put in but as it transpired you know in actual real life as it actually happens there's not a man there's no amount of money that's going to inoculate you from the hurt and the sort of betrayal and the loneliness that she feels going through especially more so social group and how she gets ostracized because you know i'm assuming especially when you're well to do and you're affluent and you go you, your kids attend a private school there's a little you know community i'd imagine amongst parents right because they mostly you know people that come from again um come from uh uh come from means they obviously have influence and all this sort of stuff and you know these people probably are not the most trusting people in the world so you kind of um allow yourself you know to lower your guard somewhat because the people that are in that school you'd assume for the most part are from a certain you know cultural bracket a certain scene whatever it may be so you you probably um leave yourself open to making friends very fairly quickly especially if you're like a socialite mum that doesn't really do anything right you just spend the riches of your um you know workaholic husband or whatever it may be or your donor so you're probably lonely you're looking for some sort of connection so imagine it not in not in nicole kidman's character because she seems to be a little bit more well adjusted but in general i love the fact that they kind of superimpose that character you know with a wealthy background instead of them being working class i think it kind of hit more that way because in our heads we're thinking oh she can deal with this easily right um she can spin the story in this press she can make it seem that like she wasn't involved she can make you know she can whatever it may be but it doesn't work out that way and I love the scene where she sort of gets ostracized from her group of friends and it happens in a very slow, methodical way. It's sort of like, you know, where it looks as you're about to go up to the gate, um, you know, a bit of distance pulling away, people kind of being short with you in conversations and just loads of whispering and kind of looks. I love it, man. And you you kind of felt the coldness kind of seep all over her, right? She just felt, suddenly you just feel a bit chilly. You start kind of covering yourself in your chest and sort of wanting to disappear under your hood oh and her coats as well nicole kidman's outfits in the entire series are really well done i actually prefer the outfit you know to, to be fair, preference wise the outfits of her friend the closest friend that she has is a sort of who's a lawyer as well or a pr person um they absolutely decked her out to the night and she looked really good whoever did the costume design um for that tv series deserves a lot of credit but really good series man the undoing i really really enjoyed it again i would i wish the ending was a bit different um the not again the annoying thing that they always do the kid in the undoing is an absolute he's he's pisses me off especially towards you know as you go towards the end of the series just like what are you doing it's what happens though, isn't it like it's like the kid in the sopranos isn't it like 
your dad is a murderous mob boss. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm sorry that you can't attend your baseball game. Do you know what I mean? Like, stop crying. Like, <laughs> it's just insane. Like, sometimes you think about these things, but, you know, I guess they try to, you know, make it seem as realistic as possible. You'd imagine if you were a kid, would you really know what your dad was getting up to? Maybe not. I don't know. But regardless, it was just funny to see how needy the kid was for his dad knowing full well that his dad's been accused of flipping murder <laughs> and he's on the run. It was just like, what is wrong with this child? But they always seem to do that. They always seem to have like an annoying kid. I think even in Ozarks, the first, you know, few seasons of it, first two, maybe it was the first season, I'm not too sure, but the kids were really annoying, right? Even more so than the wife. They were doing everything in their power to like, you know, snitch on their parents. So it's like, what are you doing? You know, if you snitch on your parents, you're going to go into flipping, you know, you're going to go into care. This isn't going to end well for you, you know? You're not going to become a TikTok star. <laughs> you're going to go into some sort of, you know, um, housing system or family, you know, family system that you probably don't want to be in, especially from that sort of background. But, you know, it hooks you in. But yeah, recommend check out The Undoing. Um, that was really good. I really enjoyed that. What else did I watch? Oh, yeah. I watched a Comedy Store documentary. That was superb. Um, More so because I'm, a, you know, of course, as you guys are aware, listening and watching this uh, podcast, you'll know that I talk sometimes a lot about the LA comedy scene and, you know, the stuff that goes on in there. And I'm a big fan of it. I've kind of got my introduction via i'm gonna say joe rogan back in the day but i sort of branched out listened to a lot of bill burr tim dylan joey diaz danish you know neil tom segura in your mum's house um theo vaughn of course tiger belly all these people and the common denominator that sort of runs through them the common theme Arisha fear of course skeptic tank duncan trussell um loads of those guys right i listen to most of their podcasts um here and there um but the common thing that runs between all of them is the comedy store, right? It's like it's synonymous with that scene. And you hear a lot about it. You hear them tell really cool stories. You see some pictures, but you don't necessarily get the vibe of it. And I think the good, the best thing that this documentary did, I'm going to get here on the screen, is that it provided you a bit of context as to why the comedy store means so much to these people. Um, it's directed by this guy. What's his name? Mike Binder? Is it Binder? Whatever his name is. Let me find it here. Mike Binder, yeah. He's a former comedian himself, but now he's a director. And he put this together, and it was such a good way to kind of, um, again, documentaries aren't going to be, you know, they're not autobiographical, auto autobiographical, right? And they're not, you know, 100% based on fact. It's just one person's perception of the events that happened during that time, especially when he's weaving together loads of different people's perspective. But I think he did a really good way of charting and kind of documenting the inception of the comedy store all the way to what we kind of know of it now. And um, I think I heard somebody some of those comedians one of them kind of criticism they said about the documentary was that it didn't really highlight what's actually going on now um again i think that was a bit unfair because i think it's hard for mike banner to do that because from what i've read in between the lines he's not really been present in comedy store himself throughout the last few years right only in maybe the last decade or so he's been kind of popping in here and there but for the most part he sort of moved on from the comedy store and you saw a lot of that you saw a lot of really big hollywood stars who i wouldn't say they sort of like I was surprised to see them in the, in the documentary because I'd never really heard them speak openly about the comedy store. It was more so like, hey, do, it was more so the director saying, hey, did you know this person came from here as opposed to that person telling you that's where they came from? Of course, the stand-up comedians are, are all right, but I think some of the movie star guys, they're a little bit, you kind of get the feeling that, you know, they used the comedy store as a launch pad in order to do the thing they really wanted to do, which is be an actor or whatever it may be. Um, nowadays, it's a bit different, right? Because obviously, um, especially with podcasting, you essentially have your own sort of uh, TV show-ish kind of thing that you can do there. Um, and then, of course, you can just concentrate on being funny and not trying to get on SNL and not trying to get a TV deal. It's a bit different. So maybe that's why it changed. But I would have liked to have seen a bit more owners placed on the now the newer generation and what they're kind of going through i still did like those episodes i think towards the end where they sort of spoke about how hard it is to get spots there the open mic night um they obviously spoke to the new booker um and his perspective and how he chooses people um really that was all really cool um but again there was a lot of harking back to the old times but in general the common thing that i really liked about it, i'm gonna click it the common thing that i really liked about it was that it reminded me a lot about why residencies and why hubs and why like places like the comedy store are important in all creative fields especially i'm gonna say like you know electronic music of course the the scene that i'm mostly interested in there's not like 
there really isn't a lot of these sort of places, right? In the oh, there really isn't a lot of these sort of places that exist in the scene now in electronic music. That's a real problem issue I have as well, especially in London. Um, they don't really we have a sort of residency sort of culture, but not really. It's something that I kind of see a lot more in mainland Europe, especially in places like Germany and Berlin, right? They seem to have, or even Frankfurt, Robert Johnson. They seem to have it figured out where they have like a place where a set amount of people can play um, most of the time during the months right on most weekends um they obviously give them priority as well during the new year's eve which one of their biggest nights it's all residents playing for the most part and it's just a way for you to kind of hone your craft develop your sound play to an obviously a rapturous and really intrigued and devoted fan base and they kind of remind me a little bit of the um what you call it uh that Leibowitz woman quote where she says something like um from a documentary that um so people always talk about you know the great artists that we lost during the AIDS, AIDS epidemic you know back in the days but she said the the other thing people don't really understand is we also lost a lot of like really nuanced and um, aware and you know culture you know smart uh, consumers who were really used to high level creative arts and practitioners so whenever a bullshit person came along they were able to kind of sift them out really quickly but when you lost a great artist and you lost the discerning consumers all a lot of shit was able to kind of pop up from the woodwork so i think that's what you got from the documentary as well you got this idea that not only were the comedians at a really high level at that time and they're all pushing each other and it was a breeding ground for talent and all this sort of stuff and they had a criteria to get in and you had to bring your best work all this sort of you know thing that happened there was also i felt like just as much there's just as much quality in the audience too of people that are willing to go to this club in the middle of nowhere and essentially pay a ticket to go see you know people that they hadn't really heard of who were just kind of getting started in the industry you know who kind of like you know had their um training wheels on i think that was really cool maybe because maybe it's different now because you hear people talk about all the time especially joe about how many killers are performing on you know the comedy store on any given night so there's probably not as much opportunity for a young and up-and-coming person to develop their act and all that sort of bloody blah 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 but I, I did really feel a little bit like man i'm jealous that they have a spot like this that exists right where they're just able to just have number one of the best people in the scene playing um or performing so on stage and also an opportunity for the, the newer generation to also get a chance to play on that same stage that's the Thing that i think like where in london i can't think of many big or like culturally relevant um you know the places that everyone rates where they also book like the best djs and they also give people up and coming a chance to play on that same stage it doesn't necessarily happen that's the issue i have sometimes um and again i don't think I don't think that's ever going to change. I think we're so obsessed here with, you know, ticketed events and, you know, headliners, all this sort of bullshit that promoters are probably worried about booking people not known because you're not going to move tickets and then punters are worried of not going to a night that you don't know who's playing and it's going to be shit. There's a lot of, you know, and then also if you're a punter and you pay 50 quid for a night full of residents and the club's only open until one, you're kind of stuck there, isn't it? There's nowhere else you can go for the most part. So I get the, I get the, I get the kind of um, limitations that are there, but I would like to be a bit more owner's place on that because you did see the fruits of the labor with the comedy store allowing, you know, both people of both subsets of groups of kind of creatives to kind of, you know, develop their act at the same time on the same platform. Of course, varying times, obviously, if you're more experienced and you're better, you just get the peak hours and all that sort of good stuff. And, you know, that was already uh, political, but I did get a lot of insight into why the comedy store is so important and, you know, why I think more than likely, you know, once the pandemic is over and they end up kind of recalling Governor Newsom, which they're doing now at the moment, which is mad. But I think once the COVID is over, I do think the comedy store will rise again. I think there'll be a new generation of people in there, maybe a changing of the guard because so many people have left LA, some people have been cancelled, blah, blah, blah. But I do think that it will rise again. Um, I think it's just it's just ingrained in LA. It's grained in the comedy scene. There's no way that that, that place can ever die, I don't think. It will even live on far... It'll, I think it will even live on, um, you know even if the building isn't around anymore. I think that's how much um, uh, cultural capital it's kind of got vested in LA. It's like, I don't know, I just feel it, like watching a documentary. Again, I've been there already. So now watching the documentary and having a bit of insight for people that used to be there, it definitely kind of opened my eyes on it. But I definitely recommend, if you're a fan of the LA comedy scene, you want to get an understanding as to why these guys are so intolerable when they're talking about the comedy store, watch this documentary. It will definitely give you an insight and appreciation on it. And it will maybe um, answer some 
lingering doubts and questions you had as to why these guys are always kind of leaving their families and going to perform for fifteen dollars, uh, whatever it may be that they kind of get paid when they're on there. But definitely check it out, man. It's really amazing. Oh, and again, um, Mitzi Shaw. Oh, what a what a legend, man. The the role that she played in kind of cultivating that entire scene. Um, the role she played in some people's careers, you know, the point that she gave them, some unhinged, some really enlightening. You hear the stories a lot, especially from Joey Diaz. But um, again, someone that doesn't really get, I don't say the credit that she deserves, but you don't really hear her getting spoken about as much. And especially with this whole, like, you know, onus on promoting um you know uh, people from diverse backgrounds whether they be women or people of different color you would assume that somebody like her who was able to somehow manage a madhouse of you know what psychopathic narcissistic um you know insecure uh stand-up comedians uh, on varying levels of success mix of all the jealousy and bitterness that ha happens in a scene when people are popping and not popping I don't know how she did it, man. Like, I don't know, really don't know how she did it. I'm sure there were some, you know, bumps along the way, but to keep that madhouse in check and to do what she did with it and to play that much of a pivot to role in people's career, like she deserves a lot more flowers, man. A lot more flowers. Again, I'm not sure, I wonder if she has a star in Hollywood. I wonder, she has a star. I don't know if she does, but she should. She have a, she should have a star, a statue, something commemorating her contribution to the arts. Because would that mean she's showing the comedy store? I don't know if a lot of these people would be where they are now at the moment that we know and love, man. Like it was, you hear a lot of people speaking about how it was something to aim for the comedy store, right? It was kind of like their, you know. I don't know. They're Madison Square Garden in some respect, right? That was the A League. You went to be alongside your, you know, the best people in the business. That's where you went. Um, really cool. And they speak about the Carlos Mencia stuff with Joe Rogan. That's really awesome. Um, he um, kind of speaks about it really well. The fact that he kind of, it's mad to think they picked Carlos Mencia over Joe Rogan in that episode, isn't it? Maddening. But of course, during that time, I'm assuming Carlos Mencia was probably, you know, he was um, hotter than, what you call it? hot in Greece or whatever they call it. Is that the term that's people use? Whatever it is. But he was hot shit back then, isn't it? So I can imagine they're, they're being put in a bit of a bind, right? This dude is essentially putting bums in seats for real. And then, you know, there's this other guy who, you know, you don't really know what's going on or a story's true or not. And I'd imagine a lot of that to do as well with the fact that, because Joe's the, I won't say that he was a, I guess because he hadn't, he didn't have as much to lose as the others. Um, he could, even though it was hurtful to get kicked out of the comedy store, he could go and restart his comedy career in another club. It wasn't that detrimental, but I'm assuming, you know, especially with how hierarchical um, the arts are in some respects, the higher you get up, the more, you know, people try and big time you comedy is just a scared isn't it they're just worried they just wanted to keep their spot they didn't want to get taken off so they just wouldn't make any noise about him um copying or taking jokes we're well, not even copying he just steal them innit? he just outright steal the jokes and do them in front of the comedian themselves absolutely nutty guy but that was a mad how that ended and i think Cosmos is still doing stand-up now i'm pretty sure but he's just doing it on his own little circuit you know fans are still um go out and see the stuff that he's done which must be difficult to deal with knowing that you know because you hear that a lot because even i would imagine in every sub in every scene in every kind of subculture you kind of want the acknowledgement and the respect of your peers and that's probably more important to you than the actual adoration of fans i think in some respect right especially peers that you rate so i can imagine how lonely and um yeah just how lonely it must be to be Cosman Sia to still have a somewhat decent career but have no comedy and f have no like you know actual comedians that you respect friends that will vouch for you that will have you on their show that will you know uh, except for bobby lee i don't hear anyone speak highly about him and bobby lee you know he's got the backbone of a you know <laughs> of kitchen roll do you know what i mean he's not the best guy to use an example but yeah man it must be so weird and then to see how both of their careers have sort of um yeah evolved over time it's a bit it's a, it must be hard to take if you're a customer and see it, mate at one point you was you know so up your own ass that you you thought stealing jokes and doing what you wanted there was no consequences to it and you you know thought this you know meathead in joe rogan was some any guy and then roland 10 to 20 years later he's you know insanely wealthy insanely culturally irrelevant you know be better than ever in stand up and then you are doing whatever he's doing you know performing to whatever crowd he's performing to like shit must be horrible must be horrible but again at least he's got a career in it i guess it, it, it could be worse it could be just not doing comedy at all but yeah recommend you check it out
the comedy store is available on showtime i think but you know if you know where to watch things you can watch things um it's a, definitely a, a really good documentary um i really really enjoyed it and again it showed me why all these guys are so obsessed with the comedy store next on the list talking about comedians and i'm gonna probably speak about this a bit more on the patreon only podcast so make sure you check that my patreon patreon.com for just agostino patreon.com for just a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o you'll find a link in the show notes down below i'm going to speak exclusively about this and delve into a bit of my experience with some of the dark arts but not on the youtube so make sure you check out patreon if you want to hear that but um this is courtesy of tmz joe mulaney checks into rehab now, I had no idea that he even had an issue anyway to begin with. I had no idea he was a former addict. So um, I guess because of the presentation, most of it has the presentation in it. I guess because he presents himself in a certain way, he's always got a suit on, he's always got his hair done right. He always looks, in, you know, he's always very kind of methodical and professional and sort of, you know, calculated and just really, you know, it feels like he takes care of his craft that you just imagine he's just an obsessive comedian, comic, um, comic geek, right? He's a stand up, um, you know, obsessive. He just wants to just you know write punchlines day after day after day premises punchline premises punchline but of course it, it, it kind of looks like he had a bit of an issue back in the day that he kind of was able to rectify i think supposedly he stopped drinking at 23 or something like that and then unfortunately due to covid and just lockdown and not being able to tour and all that stuff he unfortunately relapsed and nitrate himself into rehab again i was really surprised i had no idea that he even had an issue to begin with so um let's read the article it says the following here Joe Mulaney will be spending the holidays away from friends and family. He's checked into a rehab to treat cocaine and alcohol abuse after relapsing. TMZ has learned. Um, comedian entered rehab this past weekend and will spend at least the next 60 days at a facility in Pennsylvania. John's reportedly not fighting rehab and his friends and family are happy that he's been getting help that he needs. According to Page Six, which uh, reported in news, John struggled to stay sober during the pandemic. John, who had been sober since he was 23, was no stranger openly talking about his struggles, admitting that he's dabbing in prescription and illegal drugs. I recommend you check that out. This is a clip for from um, one of his um, comedy albums, the top part, very, very, very funny. It's a really good story, actually. It's premise about um, blacking out, actually. I think I'm pretty sure, but that was a good one. Um, yeah, so I should remember, didn't I? I don't know why I just assumed he wasn't drinking. I've, yeah, he did do that special where he kind of talks about blacking out. It's really good. Um, he said here, just last year, he said he said he started drinking at 13 years old and drank for attention. John said that he didn't know how to act until booze made him hilarious, but the struggles didn't end there. The very old comedian told Esquire for a September story, cover story, that drinking ultimately led him to using drugs he said i never liked smoking pot then i tried cocaine and i loved it the third year old comedian um added i wasn't good i wasn't a good athlete so maybe it was some young male thing of this is the type of physical feat i can do free vicodin and a tequila and i'm still standing yeah i get that man that's definitely uh something that i can um relate to in that re in that respect but yeah um i guess um get well soon and good luck to john mulaney you know because again I, I really rate him and he's one of my favorite stand-ups to be fair i love his style um i love his wit and just for generally think he's a you know an expert level joke writer so it's kind of difficult to see him going through what he's going through but this is no surprise man you know what i mean like i remember reading a report somewhere that the sales of alcohol and all that sort of stuff were through the roof during lockdown right and um, which is ironic too considering the restrictions that we have around right like you're able to you're not able to do certain things be able to go to a, you know an off license a liquor store whatever you call them where you are and buy copious amounts of alcohol cigarettes and all sorts of other stuff that some of the more um dodgy establishments sell but you're not allowed to you know have a have a dinner with some friends um have a beer with some friends or not beer, have a dinner with some friends um hang out with your family wherever it may be right um it's, it's it's always a bit backwards in that respect so i would assume if you're an addict or going through whatever you're going through especially with the restrictions because i'm sure this it's definitely impacted meetings right for aa and recovery and all that sort of stuff so that support group um, isn't there plus just a distraction because this made me think a lot about um the fact that you know a lot of these coming especially when the crystal ear stuff popped off i think there was some screenshots being shared of brendan Shaw creeping people's dms and a few other people and it seemed like a lot of the dudes in the scene were just essentially using um the road as an excuse to maybe just get fucked up in general because maybe you can't do it at home it's a bit you know it's a bit odd to do it no it's odd it maybe it could cause some conflict in your household considering you're at home you're hardly at home and then when you are you're always hung over I, I can't imagine many partners being happy with that so maybe they kind of reserve all that stuff and leave it for when they get on the road and then of course if you're on the road you're going to see 
you're going to places where people don't see you often there's a heightened excitement i'd imagine there's a lot of thoughts around right who are ready to sort of do whatever is needed because i know they won't see you again in months if not years so there's a lot of temptation that exists out there and essentially if you want to you could essentially keep all that stuff off radar um you know just don't use your social media that much when you're out there people post you at the shows but you can keep that stuff kind of um contained to some extent so i can imagine if you're an addict this can be a really tempting to kind of consistently put yourself out on the road and make so completely busy so imagine what it must be like for people who essentially need the road just to um stem the boredness and to distract them from their addictive urges that's kind of what i got from this and it like they need a road to kind of distract them from the dark arts like i can't be at home from my home my fingers get twitchy um i got money in my pocket i got access and then boom suddenly you're you know drinking a bottle of jameson and you know with an eight ball in your back pocket like i can imagine that going that way very very quickly so um that's one again one of the unfortunate consequences of lockdown of course unfortunate consequences of not abiding by the rules as in general as people right i think in the west we find it we find it really hard to kind of wrangle with this idea of sort of sacrificing our own personal liberties for the betterment of society in general right there was a moment where some people were arguing debating about the um validity or necessity um of wearing a face mask right forget everything else just the face mask alone was a big deal i um, mean america you see how they're going on right people are like oh i'm not gonna be muzzled like a dog you know god made my mouth and nose to breathe all this sort of random mad 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 shit that you think to yourself man like do you guys not want to leave do you guys not want to be free and do what you want in everyday life do, are you okay with these restrictions and again maybe it's the directions for the government they didn't really give people a timeline of when things could change they didn't really give people a goal there wasn't very clear that the directions the threat at stake whatever the case but this is just one of those unfortunate circumstances unfortunate consequences of this lockdown um, many many people you know those suffering from mental health issues those suffering from just loneliness and not having family and friends around them and just getting out of that routine especially if you're just imagine just living in a place like new york that's always on as well or those kind of cities right where it's always on hustle and bustle you probably never seen your city that quiet right or that still so just generally just the kind of um frantic nature of always getting up going to work never having enough time to get breakfast and doing all this to go into the starbucks on the way there like all that routine is completely gone that's going to take something out of you especially if you don't have anything else that you do outside of those things because I'm not one to disparage people's hobbies, but I do think, you know, especially in the day of the, the era of the smartphone, people probably spend a lot more time on their smartphones than they do doing something that they actually enjoy doing, like a recreational activity. It doesn't exist outside of what? Drinking and hanging out with friends and eating their places. So when that when that's gone, especially the social aspect of going to work as well, hanging in the office, it's no surprise that some people are suffering the way they are. So again, um, get well soon to John Mulaney. Hopefully he's okay and he has, you know, supports us around him that he needs. And, you know, if anyone else has they're struggling seek the help that you can get at the you know when it's not too late you know it's not good to wait until the last moment when you're really on your deathbed or you sort of exhausted all your funds and you're standing there naked in your living room and then someone checks you in like try and do it off your own accord if possible but yeah that was a bit of a surprise in that one a bit of a surprise on that one what else we have Ooh. oh yeah this is a funny let's move on so this is a you know me and i love my um karen videos right um this is a funny one um there's we don't really get the whole story behind it but what we see is a young female looks like a, one of those um tiktok fitness people making a video in a gym um i'm assuming for her content on her feed and we hear over here karen arguing and sort of like you know complaining that she's using a weight that she wants to use and of course you know naturally the tiktok influencer person is like this this is a gym you know what i mean this isn't the only weight that exists here you can find many other ways just walk around so i'm assuming the karen just didn't want to walk and she went that pacific way at that particular that pacific time and got offended that the you know influencer was a bit short with her but this is one of my pet peeves in gyms i absolutely hate people that just talk to you point blank right unless you work there and you're telling me there's a fire alarm or to move my jacket from the thing whatever it may be unless you work there i don't want to ever hear your voice at all unless it's like hey this is free or you can go next or something don't have a conversation with me don't tell me things i absolutely hate that stuff but let's see the clip anyway do you see the 20 yeah. do you see those other dumbbells honey okay cool are you serious <laughs> there's an entire gym like use the entire gym yeah but 
Nobody here is using the 27 Hey, pounds. nobody here was in this area until you walked wow. in. Wow. Wow well, is right. You know, I can go complain. Go right complain. Now. Okay. Go for it. Because I'm using one dumbbell. And he's going to come and tell you to use it up for me. There's nothing worse, right? There is nothing worse than this. And I understand from the Karen's point of view, it's annoying when somebody's doing a super, is it a super set, right? Super set, somebody's doing, you know, got a lot of weights around them and they're going for a circuit. It can be annoying because they take up a lot of room. They might be using the thing that you want to use, but I'm sorry. If I'm using that thing, it's such a common understanding that we have as gym people, gym goers, right? You wait until I'm finished and you use it. I sort of ascribe it to the same idea it's sort of similar, familiar to me, like a bit where, you know, when you're at a cash point and somebody's taking too long in front of you, you don't tap them on the shoulder and tell them to hurry up. You might make some noises, you might make some groans, you might shuffle your feet somewhat, but there's an understanding that, okay, as annoying as it is that they're taking long, that's their time at the, the machine. When they're finished, you can go and use it. Now, it's annoying when they're then finished and you go up to it and it says out of order, that can be super annoying and it can make your, you know, blood boil. But for the most part, that's the kind of understanding we have as, you know, adults but there's dude these people do exist in a gym where again we don't have the whole story but i can imagine she just doesn't want to walk to the other side of the gym where there's another rack of free weights you know it's it's funny that they're referring to kettlebells as you know dumbbells which they're not so she didn't want to walk probably she doesn't know what she, the weight is called so she's referring to it as a dumbbell when it's a, when it's a kettlebell and just generally i think there's a bit of um i wouldn't say it's envy but there's a bit of annoyance with some people when they see people that are obviously like, you know, she's obviously in great shape, this influencer woman, right? Um, I get I get the feeling sometimes when these people interrupt you and they want to like talk to you or tell you off or tell you to do something the way that they want it to be done, it's kind of their sort of like passive aggressive way of informing you that they don't, you don't, you're not better than them. Like, hey, just because you're doing this superset and you know what you're doing and you got your little mini whiteboard and you're doing your chick chalking off all your reps doesn't mean that you are you're deserving of this area more than i am i don't know i i get the feeling of something in, there's some sort of like weird um uh dormant jealousy sort of thing going on in there which is odd too considering that most people in gyms the most that usually in my in my experience the nicest people in gyms are the most fittest people the people who don't need to like be in there probably right the ones who looked completely ripped and they're you know they got all the muscles in the right places everything's tight and we're you know and taut those are the people that are usually the nicest it's usually the kind of ones that turn up in jean shorts and um jordans that are the absolute dickheads those are the ones that are gonna make your life an absolute hell um you know the last time i went to a gym especially when it's open or when we when they have the restrictions when i got and when some guy tried to fight me off the bench press that was one of those dudes who looked like you know he could have been playing football or something right he didn't really have any gym attire on he was just waiting to use the dumbbells to get his arms and chest big, his arms bigger and of course the bench press to get his chest bigger and i was maybe taking what 10 minutes longer than he wanted me to be on there and considering as well you know you'd imagine in most gyms if you're on a machine you're on a machine unless it's like you know unless you see me get on it at the same time as you and i'm like on it for an hour then maybe you're like hey when's you gonna finish but if if you especially if you see me get on it you just have to let me finish when i finish for the most part um it's just a wild thing to say to somebody like you know you know that dumbbell's mine or why are you using that one so i just go find another one again i'd maybe it's just me I'd, i don't ever want to speak to people when i go in the gym i just want to do my workout and go home um maybe there's some people that you know that you want to say safe to and have a little catch up about football but for the most part you keep the conversations very short if you need to speak to somebody it's like you know quickly hey sorry mate are you using that boom just take it i mean no i'm not using it cool whatever exchange a little bit of a head nod but this sort of like why are you using this not using that thing that should be reserved for the staff right and let's say say hey this is a fire hazard you cannot be doing your set with your tiktok videos in this place because you're blocking the you know the pathway for people to leave or fire exit cool that's the conversation they have every right to speak to you they they work there but just random people that are, that kind of you know say wind your neck in relax you're not that important do you know what i mean like hey hey it's nothing nothing i hate more than that man. nothing more and then the other one <laughs> is a freaky video. This is a police officer regarding, I guess a police officer is basically ejecting a parent in a library because I guess the parent decided to go to a library with their child and refused to wear a face mask. Um, 
you know, she's essentially using her child as a prop, as a uh, protest uh, vehicle to get her point across that she thinks the uh, requirement to wear or the mandate to wear face mask or face covering indoors is unconstitutional in some way, shape or form. And of course, you know, who can say no to a mother with a child in a library? That's one of the most like, you know, <laughs> sympathetic moves ever. But unfortunately she meets her match because this police officer is just not having it. So let's uh, play a little bit of that now for you guys. The whole because time we were in here. Nine one one has time for that. No, so please, we, okay. I just want to I sit, sit here and read with you while your son reads. Okay, we are nine one one. We are first responders. I love how t short she's being with her. Like, woman, mum, wake up, right? You're being ridiculous now. You meant to wear a face covering. You've been in here, for, you know, causing a scene. I'm an actual police officer. I'm meant to be stopping, you know, uh, robbers and rapists. You know, what I mean? I'm not meant to be babysitting you. Leave. Pick up your child and leave. <laughs> Okay, so I wasn't bothering anybody, madam. Okay, I think it's time for you to wrap up and leave for today. I love it. Coming back another day may be your best option. Because today is not good. I love Why? it. Because you clearly caused a disturbance and there's an issue. No, they just called because I wouldn't put a mask on. I wasn't causing any... That is causing a the disturbance. They just called because I want to put a mask on. That is quintessentially used, you know, causing a disturbance. They want you to put a mask on. You're refusing it. You have a back and forth. Hey... We call that a disturbance. Disturbance? I wasn't raising my voice. I wasn't yelling at anybody. That's fine. And there's a picture. In the, if you're listening to the podcast, there's a video of his course as the police officer um, in front of the lady on a small table in a library. And there's also another video within it of some dude in a Walmart or something lying on the floor. So I guess he's refusing to leave. These people are wild. I get the whole idea about not wanting to wear a mask. I get it. I think you should um have the right to do whatever you want to do but when it comes to going to people's private businesses just do it because they say and you want to get the thing that you need in there and then everything else in any other scenario or in any other setting where you're not sort of like mandated to wear one that's when you can start putting your middle finger up like select your places like you know you're not really sticking it to the man by making the sales assistant job at walmart harder you're not sticking it to the man by causing a disturbance at a local library do you know what i mean these people that are working there are part of the same community that you're in they're not exactly the people in the government that are sort of like you know um leaving you desolate during this crazy time they're the ones that are just doing their best to keep the lights on and put food on the table just as you are this is wild was it okay Today. I'm not trying to... Okay, get your books. You can check out your books and you can leave. Okay? I'm not breaking any laws. You're about to be if you do not leave. What law would I be breaking? Because you're causing a disturbance. I'm not. In a public place. I'm not causing a disturbance. Okay. I'm not going to sit here and argue with you. What is your name? That's a really good tactic, right? Because she could, I think, I was thinking in my head, you're not causing, I'm not causing a disturbance. And then she could say, yes, you are. Then you get into that kind of petulant, adolescent, back and forth. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, no. yes, you are. She said, okay, you're going to need to leave. It's just like very, it reminds me of like um, how expert bouncers are sometimes, right? I remember I got caught out one day like that one time where I was like really drunk and I was somewhere. I don't know where I was. And I was, I guess, talking too much in the hallway and the bounce like, hey, let me have a word with you. Come here, let me, let me talk to you some. I was like, yeah, what's up? Talk to me, come on, come here. He started leading me down the corridor. Let me, come here, let me, just, let me have a word. And, 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 you know, without me realizing, after about two minutes, I'm outside. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't get back in again. He did it so effortlessly. Like, Look, you've had enough to drink. You're probably a bit too fucked up. Get yourself a cab before he gets to Larry and go home. I was like, and he, he just like, F, like, really like um casually chucked me out without you know throwing me out flipping um jazzy jeff style and fresh prince that was really expertly done because he could easily told me to shut the fuck up it could have then turned into an argument then all of a sudden it goes into it goes left you could have pushed me you could have done whatever you wanted right because i was obviously being belligerent but he just you know quietly just said hey come over a second let me have a word of you goes in the corner another corner another hallway stairs and then suddenly we're outside <laughs> and when we got outside he was actually speaking to me and then i realized hold on i'm outside can i go get my stuff no 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 you can't get your stuff show me a ticket and i'll get your coat for you i was like wow this is, he, he played me expertly i'll give you my name i'll give you a card 
You need to get your son and check out your books and you can come back but, another day. It's not a good example. <laughs> Listen, how, how is this going to be documented? Because I was not causing a disturbance. It's gonna, there's going to be a report done. Ma'am, there's going to be a report, and you can get a report number, and you can get I love it. your attorney. I love it. Please get your stuff. Please get your stuff before you get trespassed. It's the country that we live in now. And a son's there as well, who looks like, what, he might be under 10 years old? What kind of example is this to set for your children? God damn. This is straight up discrimination. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love when white women, especially as Karen, scream discrimination. This is reverse racism. Welcome to the club, lady. We've been suffering through this from the moment we touched your godforsaken land. Welcome to the club. Come on, Sammy. Look at that cute little kid is. It's a man mandates are not laws, just so you know. And I guess you don't know that. Thanks for telling us that. Cheers. <laughs> oh, I hate these people, man. They're so annoying. I don't hate them for their choices and what they want to do in their lives, honestly. I just hate them more so for the disturbance they cause to other people. They make everyone else's life a living hell. They don't it's sort of like um you know, um how do you think about it? I kind of describe it a little bit similar to like, you know, somebody that's not a really good holiday pal right that's not a good holiday company that's how i describe these sort of karens it's like it's never self it's never it's never insulated or it's never directed to the person that they're sort of arguing with it's always like a kind of a, a declaration or opportunity to attack a whole community of people or a situation or uh an idea or something else that you feel. i mean it's always it always it's always like a tornado of absolute bullshit like rain it in Rain it in. We're all going through our stuff. We don't need to hear your nonsense day in, day out, innit? God damn it. God damn it. Anyway, moving on. COVID rules have changed in the UK, especially in London and South East. Um, unfortunately for myself, of course, seeing as I live here. Um, crazy times, man. One moment, again, I think I made a video the other day or I was talking about it in the other podcast about, oh, we need to cancel Christmas, right? And I was being for real, cancel Christmas. And for the most part, a lot of people online were like, no, we shouldn't cancel Christmas. This is ridiculous. People need to see their families. Cool. I was just saying, you know what? In the long term, considering that we've been under some sort of restrictions for what? The best part of 10 months. And it's looking like we're going to go into the second year kind of of living under these restrictions. And especially with the news of the vaccine, wouldn't it make more sense to just be like, hey, Let's sacrifice our Christmas and have a at home one, not go see families and all this sort of stuff so that we can then have a much freer um, and restriction, yeah, a much freer and hopeful new year. That would be the best way to go about it, especially with the vaccine. That was what added to it because I think I was of this. I was thinking, I was thinking this way prior to the vaccine. That when the vaccine was approved, it was like, hey, we've got something here that can allow us to kind of go back and function the way we were prior in 2019. Why are we kind of pushing for this five day break to go see our families in Christmas when the numbers are peaking? It just didn't make any sense. It's winter, flu season, all this stuff. And of course, you know, Boris Johnson was mocking people, telling you know, trying to spin it as uh, people wanting to cancel christmas and all this sort of weird shit and it, it, it turned into one of those things where most governments are like this isn't it whenever they introduce something and the public don't react the best to it they kind of always double down in, in a sort of sh weird quasi way of showing force and authority i don't know it's always a strange thing they do and then you know usually when presented with the information that counteracts what they've said previously especially to a degree where it's going to cost lives they suddenly then reverse and do the quote-unquote u-turn I'm not opposed to U-turns. I think U-turns are good. I think some of the uh, media at the moment, especially the mainstream media in the UK, have, you know, for the most part, the Tory party isn't the most... Um um, I guess people don't like to admit they're Tory because you know, they won the election. So I'm assuming there's a lot more Tories that exist in the UK than people like to admit. But in general, they don't have the best reputation when it comes to left-leaning um, publications. So they always frame the U-turns as like a negative thing. But I don't mind people reversing or changing their mind about a position or a view or a law or something that put into place, you know, when presented with more evidence and more information. The issue I have with the U-turns is that there's no need to do a U-turn when you should make the right decision in the first place. You know, we had 
information from all the top scientists that the numbers were peaking. We had this new development of a supposed, um, which has been now uh, confirmed. We had a mutation of the COVID virus, which is not more lethal, but more transmissible from what we've heard so far. Um, the evidence is still a little bit skeptical about that, but that's what we've got, what we gleaned. Just with those points alone, it would be enough to, for cause for concern to just pause things, right? Then it didn't. They wait until the the kind of the, what, what do they say? The, the final minute to sort of declare that they've changed the rules. And then by that time, people, I think that was what, Friday or something, right? And people were out shopping, getting their last Christmas stuff in and just generally living their sort of like tier three life. And then suddenly tier four comes in, all non-essential shops close within 24 hours and you can't go out. You can't, you know, you're advised not to go to other areas um, outside of tier four. It's like, what the fuck? Absolute chaos on the streets of London, absolute chaos. And again, it could have, this is all avoidable, it really is avoidable, but you know, we live where we live. Article here from The Guardian. COVID rule tier four, new rules for London and South East. It says the following, uh, Boris Johnson announced uh, new tier four restrictions for London, the South East and uh, East of England amid a surge in COVID-19 cases. What does tier four mean? Under the tier four restrictions, it's going to keep going up in there. We're going to definitely have tier five next year for sure. If they, because my theory is they want to avoid a national lockdown because they don't want to give people more free money or quote unquote free money or support, economic support. So they're going to do everything in their power to keep running with this whole like regional lockdown thing which is doesn't really make much sense i think maybe just for the collective um for the civic duty side of things it would make more sense that you know we should all be under some restrictions so that we all feel like we're going through the same thing because if you live up north you're going to be feeling you're feeling a little bit victimized the fact that you've probably lived um under tire restrictions for a longer period of time even though your numbers are better than ours down south so if we're all under the restrictions and we all kind of get you know um we all kind of get re the restrictions kind of get reviewed in a you know maybe a month to month to four week on a three week basis whatever it may be and we kind of come down or go up collectively i think it'll be a bit more i think maybe it might be received a bit better but when london goes to tier two for some reason and manchester's still in tier three and then somehow we go to tier three then again and then manchester have better numbers than us at tier two but they still stay in tier three i can definitely see where um there could be a lot of anger and distrust of the government feeling like there's a bit of favoritism with people down in the south in of england um so i don't know definitely tier five coming next year especially if they don't want to do national lockdowns so under tier four restrictions no social shops hairdressers leisure centers entertainment venues must close with new stay-at-home measures introduced people who need to travel for education and child care are exempt and exercise is unlimited um, as outdoors i'm guessing where people cannot work from home they will not be able to travel to work under these measures households are not allowed to mix but one person is allowed to meet with what other person outside of a public space support bubbles and those meeting a child care exempt um what does this mean it says in london the southeast people must stay at home over christmas and must not meet with other households one resident can meet up with another one for a walk but not a whole household of people in the rest of england the window of multiple household meeting has been reduced to five um windows between between 23rd and the 27th to just Christmas Day, as it always should have been. Um, what can I do in each tier? People in each tier advice say local, and of course tier three and the other ones. But just absolute shit show of a situation in it. Really, really is. Um, makes no sense why they decided to wait for them to find out right, things to move. Um, and of course, the empty streets in London. Of course, people, you know, nowhere to be found in central London. Very um, eerie sight, kind of reminiscent of what was happening earlier on in March. And then you've got here um, people who organized weddings, right? And they had to do it within two hours in order to kind of beat the restrictions. You saw some other story of um, somebody else, I forgot who it was. There was another person who said, what happened oh someone said i think they kind of, they visited from korea or something and they came to the uk of course to stay with their family and then overnight the rules changed and then suddenly they can't even leave the area that they're in hotel wise to go visit their family so it's like i came here for nothing of course the people that are going to want to go see the family are going to break the rules regardless as it was always going to happen i thought that would have been a good thing i think maybe they decided to do the christmas break because they went to absolve themselves of blame so people go to meet up with their family they can be like hey it's not our fault but um yeah one absolute shit show of a situation and that people have organized their weddings in four days you've got of course the nations <laughs> across europe deciding to uh, ban travel which is hilarious this is here from the bbc european nations have began to impose travel bans on the uk after reported a more infectious and out of control coronavirus variant ireland germany france italy netherlands 
and Belgium are all halting flights. The measures vary and are initially short term, but French rules also affect channel freight. So that means more than likely no Bergheim until what? 2022 end of 2022 for me if if this is going the way it's going because you know germany's numbers are peaking super high um they've obviously enforced um some very strict rules there i think they've got a curfew you no know, self alcohol all this sort of because no you can't drink alcohol on the street all this all good stuff and they've actually got the police side on the streets you know like you know survey like, i've not even seen police on the streets telling people to go indoors so they've got some of those COVID compliance officers, but they're just, you know, they're just jobs worse with um, reflective jackets on. You know what I mean? They're not going to tell anyone anything, but at least they've got that in Germany. So maybe it's going to be, you know, opened up. But if anyone thinking about going to a festival, oh, it's looking shaky, man. It's looking shaky. Um, an EU meeting on Monday morning will discuss a more um, coordinated response. The new variant um, has also spread quickly in London and Southeast England. Prime Minister Boris Johnson said Saturday, choosing a new tier four level of restrictions for those areas scrapping a planned relaxation of the rules in christmas period for millions of people <laughs> didn't he say earlier it was inhumane to scrap christmas break <laughs> he said so. i don't know man the one thing you've realized with covid during this lockdown right people really love their birthdays right many many of a celebrity have been caught going to their birthdays or organizing birthday parties and other regular civilians and also people love christmas those are two no people love yeah people love their holidays their birthdays and christmas because you saw that in the summer everyone was like you know running away to where they were going to Greece and parts of Spain when they were sort of like semi-open. And obviously, you know, now, um, now for some reason, everybody in America that has money is going to Aspen. Um, and before that, they were going to like Cabo and places like that, right? And in the UK, people are now going to Dubai. That seems to be the kind of like the hot destinations to go to. Um, so <laughs> again, who knows how that's going to work? Health Secretary Matt Hancock said a new strain was out of control and we've got to get under control. Admitting that this was a very, this was an incredibly difficult end to a frankly awful year. Yeah, you can say that again. And you guys haven't helped and then we've got this video here of uh people fleeing london right uh, like something out of a movie and um, this is from where this is a tweet here from Disclose or TV. New London goes to tier four, hard lockdown due to more infections of COVID-19 strain. St. Pancreas International Rail Station, right? This is King Cross. So this is the main, one of our main little hubs of places that allows you to go to various parts outside of London, right? Long distant trains and all that malarkey. Um, the terminus for Eurostar services from central London to Belgium, France and Netherlands is packed. That's where the Eurostar is as well. And look at it, look at the people. So many people. Usually it's full anyway in general, but just imagine a last minute dash of people trying to get on the train, trying to buy last minute tickets, like swapping, arguing. Absolute horror show. And the funny thing is a lot of these people are probably gonna have to stay where they're at for another month or maybe a couple of weeks more, right? Because I think they're gonna review the restrictions on what? on the 30th i think of december so things might change but still that's not a lot of time for you to like buy your return ticket right you have to get your affairs in order and then leave so there might be a, a scenario where a lot of people are going to be stranded in in countries outside of london or areas outside of london for the best part of january maybe the whole of january like wild scenes isn't it we've dealt with this so badly <laughs> and then of course you've got this um you know view from a helicopter of central London looking absolutely desolate and empty just full of buses and no people whatsoever and this is the day after people were packed in, in the shops going to get their last minute Christmas shopping done and now look absolutely no one anywhere great for a skate though right if you're gonna go skate this is probably the prime time to go you can film some good street footage out there put a strap on a GoPro and just try and get as many tricks in before you get nicked by the police that would be a pretty good way to go out in it. A pretty good way to go out. But yeah, this is where we are, man. Hanging on and just <laughs> hoping Boris doesn't introduce more tears. Oh, mate. Our life in the UK is absolutely a madness. I wonder what's going to happen with the lawsuit because I think the mayor of uh, Manchester, Andy Burnham, was putting together a lawsuit and with um, together with the Knights of Sasha Lord. I wonder if they're still going to continue with that in light of this news. I'd imagine they wouldn't it because, you know, they've been dealt a hard blow up there but yeah we've probably um maybe some people this is probably maybe some karmic value before being a little bit too upper and nasty in general as london is but <sighs> crazy times man crazy crazy times next on the list what else do we have here 
we have we have we have we have we have yeah we have this actually this is what i want to talk about just briefly because they're going to come out very very soon so as you guys are aware i am a i'm now a what somewhat retired sneakerhead um there was a time in my life where i had more than 300 shoes or so um especially when i used to work you know in various sneaker stores across the london scene you know was an avid um member De determined devoted passionate member of the london or the uk sneaker community specifically crooked tongues right around the best forums that ever existed in the history of man um and just you know ob obsessively obsessed obsessively committed myself to collecting and buying as many trainers as i could in the shorter space of time and just kind of diving on deep in that whole entire scene and making it my life's work to get uh, hold as many rare shoes as I could in it and of course over time that stuff changes you get older um this and again the the, the, the way of buying stuff keeps changing um it gets difficult to buy the things that you want and you just get a bit disillusioned in it but you still maintain that love for shoes especially the the grails especially the kind of um wardrobe staples that you can kind of mix up into the outfits I wear nowadays because I don't really wear conventional sneakerhead outfits that I used to wear back in the day right baseball cap t-shirts hoodies jeans a particular style right that you could always fit a shoe in now my, my outfits kind of you know are a bit i would say uh have a bit more range to them so it's difficult to just insert a sneaker in any outfit that you're wearing it has to kind of make sense but one of the staples i think is a you know very versatile shoe and can go just about anything i have in my wardrobe now is the mx95 for again one of my maybe top five sneakers i'd say yes yeah, in my top five right mx uh, mx90 air force one jordan four mx95 and then what else will be in my top that's four so far but anyway definitely in my top five of shoes um and it's coming out um end of the month the air max 95 neon one of my favorite colorways and it's just a beautiful shoe man like it's just an absolutely gorgeous shoe like i remember when i first saw them it must have been a scan from one of those japanese sneaker magazines right and um uh boot or whatever it was called what was it uh atmos had one too there was a few but i remember seeing them in one of those shoots they have where they sort of have a list of a sort of a grid full of just shoes all really tightly laced um code or jp exclusive some grs whatever it may be and they just have like every single i wish i could find a scan like every single color variant variation of an mx95 especially it would be good to find them now, especially to give me an insight or an idea on what to what to do when it comes to doing them on ID. Because I find the Air Max 90 silhouette one of the most difficult to sort of design on Nike ID or the, what they call it now, uh, Nike Bios or whatever it's called now, some gay name. But whatever it's called now, I, I find it very difficult to design on this um on this shoe on this shape there's so many panels it's just difficult to get the color combinations right but using some of the references from all the other old um you know colorways that they did in the past is a really good launching pad but in general i love the shape i love everything about the shoe i think again it works really well dressed up dressed down um combats you know like kind of camo fatigue pants bdus you see those kind of being worn a lot in shoots of mx 95s back in the day you see a lot of people wearing shorts uh, kind of like an acg is kind of flavor really short short colors contrasting socks works really well in the uk there was a big culture of like what do you call them rude boys in the uk who used to wear these i remember that was back in the I, I, maybe even before that were they sort of like the that's what you'd prefer like the ukg um, which means uk garage sort of heads right who would go to like raves wearing Versace shirts, Armani shirts, Ben Sherman shirts with great blue jeans and a pair of MX 95s, right? Kind of, you know, um, laced very loosely. And that was the vibe that everyone had, you know, a couple of buttons undone, um, a nice little gold cap, a sovereign ring, just doing the damn thing. And that was a vibe. I loved it. Um, you know, before the designer sneaker thing came in and just kind of killed the scene and people's creativity. But I love the shoe as well because it's, I think, I might say it's one of the, a few nike shoes that were specifically designed without the smoosh in mind i think the swoosh was a kind of a boardroom level uh, decision to swap to place the swoosh on the back of the hill from what i remember originally the, the original designer for the 95 wanted it just to be like a you know completely tonal no swoosh no real branding on the outside and that would end up because you've got a bit of branding on the tongue you know with the mx whatever it may be but imagine what they would have looked like just without the actual swoosh on the side if they did come out that way but again a classic shoe um that's due to come out at the end of the month like you can't go wrong with a neon 95 um, i've had a few pairs over the years i had an og pair that was crumbled on me now the nowadays the bubble has sort of kind of been um 
purposely sh- i wouldn't say shrunken but maybe enclosed the old bubbles used to protrude out a little bit more but they used to pop um and burst over time and yellow and all that sort of stuff and i guess from a kind of a quality standards point of view nike changed it and then started to either make the bubble smaller or they encased them more with the midsole so that it covers more of it i did read i remember seeing on a forum somewhere somebody some guy decided to take a scalpel to the midsole to expose more of the actual bubble itself like cutting it away which was wild because you know one false move and you could pop the bubble itself and the shoe is rendered uh, useless at that point but again beautiful 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 shoe um, from Hypebeast is the following it's been 25 years since Nike I don't know why they put in a stock um, listing them Nike that's a bit gay um, Seminole MS95 Neon made its retail debut in 1995 so the swoosh is honoring a quarter century of the Neon with a true to the original re-release designed by Sergio Lozano of course Italian that's why it's really big over there and the 97 as well I'm not sure it's 97 it's um, Italian I'm sure. but it doesn't matter um, it's inspired by the human anatomy the Neon was an aspirational pack peaks of Nike's um, 90s Air Max footwear to many Da, 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 da. and it was their favorite mx90 ever um the uppers are centered around a wavy anatomy inspired side panels with a grayscale fade starting with light tones um, on the top before shifting to dark on the bottom there's also multiple dashes of it, 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 the eponymous neon present on the eyelet small hill swoosh and circular tongue um the nike max 95 has been reported to come out on the 17th which is what i thought right so i put my name through on the end launches site but now it's been updated to the 30th which is great do you know what I mean? so end of the month it's going to be coming out very very soon so definitely keep you abreast and eye on that one again one of my favorite shoes i absolutely love everything about the ms95 in celebration of the 21st anniversary it's back look at that absolutely gorgeous you can't go wrong with ms95 and then to kind of commemorate it they put together this really cool film um seven store um it's a liverpool based uh retail store i've not really heard of them but this um, actual film itself is absolutely sick man so i'm gonna play a bit of it for you now put the sound a bit low there so it doesn't burst your eardrums get on big screen and boosh so that... webs what did someone call them? The Swiss Army Web. Every skull so must have had a pair of ones. Well better. Save everything that you had to make sure you could bag a pair of them. You haven't got a scouts passport in the one so Classic ones are the ones. Well better. Where would, uh, question, where would the Air Max, Air Max range be without Europe? We made Air Maxes, innit? Because I don't think the US cared about Air Maxes as much as we did. Like we absolutely adore the MXs. Like there's no MX in the UK or in the Europe, especially. I think of, you know, the UK, I think of Netherlands, I think of France, parts of Spain. We're in love with MXs, even Eastern Europe. Like those guys, you know, they love a good MX. Like we absolutely love MXs. It would be cool if Nike could see that and maybe make a few more retros out true to the originals without the annoying banana foot thing, toe box thing that always occurs and some of the retros they put out. Um, making actual retros that look like, like one of the retros that has actually been a travesty to the scene to the community and to sneak ahead to worldwide i think still that hurts my soul two air maxes the air stab and the mx light like that retro those two retros of those two shoes it still hurts my heart how fuck they got them like i think of how beautiful the air max structure was that first came out the first colorway that i got saw like the black white and teal colorway and then you know the subsequent ones were absolutely dog shit but that first one i got was beautiful they even had the sort of like papery mesh toe box thing done right but the mx light is so bad compared to the og so horrible um I don't, and again, people always say, oh, the tooling, they don't know how to have the right molds. The years have gone by. It's like, I'm sorry. They're a billion dollar company, Nike, right? Like, they they can make it, they can remake tooling. Um, they can get a pair of archive shoes and basically deconstruct them, like, you know, these um, replica factories are doing in China. Like, there is no excuse now. When you see what Adidas are doing with their sort of like 80s um, capsule things that they, yeah, well, the 80s retros they put out, right? They've got, I think I saw a forum the other day that was superb. Obviously, the, the Superstar 80s are great. The campuses are great. Um, they're able to kind of recreate that shape, that silhouette expertly done right reverse engineering whatever it may be and again 
no one's telling you to sell those shoes for 50 pounds i'm more than willing as aiders do they put a bit of a markup on their sort of like ones that are done to og standards that are sold specifically to sneakerheads who care about the box um the label the colors whatever the midsole um you know material and composition like slap a bit of extra money on that put you know a hundred pound extra on top of it sneakers will blap it up like you're telling me if they brought out a air max one right in the you know especially the air max one in like the white and red white and blue white and green black on black colorway to spec of the original air max ones that came out back in the day with the actual bigger bubble the exposed bit on the inside you know the mesh on the inside the mesh tongue do you really think they wouldn't sell for 200 250 you won't tell me like actual mx aficionados wouldn't buy that up i'd buy up the entire store mate do you know what i mean like but what can you do because you knew once you wore them you were a part of the texture the fabric of what makes the city express itself they've got to be branded as like liverpool shoe and they weigh 110 pounds back in the day that's what it was and that name still lives on 110s it still lives on no repetition steady standing in seven so you pretend that they're dead the more expensive that's what the army kids want to well better the lads in school and that always had them on tennis. If you didn't dress like that, you'd get it mixed out of you. The fighting spirits are a massive part of being a scouser. You are taught to fight for everything. Fight for yourself, fight for what's right. You know, it's pride, isn't it? It all, it all comes down to scout pride. It's the dream, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Everyone wants to be from the pool, don't we? Well, better. And get together. We always get together here. You just say Liverpool and they just know exactly where you're from. Nay, for Liverpool, it's about representing real people. Gosh, it's definitely a part of, a part of the culture in Liverpool. Oh, yeah, probably, yeah. All black and all round town. It's about representing the areas in which you're marginalised and which you've been tarnished by stereotypes. It's mad, isn't it? Really? Well, better. Since back in the day, as long as I remember, Sick. I've always wanted a pair of Air Max on my feet. It's been standing. You know, why shouldn't you have nice things? Why shouldn't you dress in a nice way? Well, that's it. What a great video, man. One tens. Awesome. But yeah, let's um, hopefully, hopefully the Nike sneaker gods decide to that I'm um, worthy enough to have a pair when they, you know, when the raffle gets drawn at launch at end. And if not, then I have to succumb to purchasing one in the aftermarket, a place like, you know, StockX, whatever else they may be. Because unfortunately, these sneaker brands don't want us to own shoes. <laughs> and then and just to cap it all off, look at the demand, right? This is from the Liverpool Echo. Uh, police called to size after hundreds queue for one day tens at ms95 neon sale like great to see in it such an iconic shoe first law i think this is a great activation actually from nike deciding to first launch it in store at size in liverpool um of, of, of course sizes and a flipping mum and pop independent store don't get me wrong but you know it's a picture of the sneakers sneaker world scene at the moment they do a good job at sort of bridging the gap i i feel between like um tier zero you know uh one away places to like the J I won't say JD Sports, but they do a good job of kind of filling that niche, right? That kind of little gap in between that sort of like foot patrol esque kind of store where they're able to carry some of the more limited shoes but also able to carry stuff that, you know, that are a little bit above that level. Things that you might find in like a designer store, you know, one of those kind of multi brand stores like um, Essence or whatever. So it says here, um, crowds of shoppers were dispersed this morning after hundreds of people queued up outside of size, right? It's so really refreshing to see queues in real life, not actual people using bots online to buy up the entire stock and then pose them on Instagram. Um, it says it is for about 100, 400 people gathered to get in line for MS95 OG Neon release. The trainer release is arguably the most anticipated shoe release of the year, as this particular Neon colorway trainer hasn't been available in OG form for years. Yeah, true. The last one I got must have been 2014, I'm going to say. At a stretch of just out there randomly 2014 that might have been last time i got a pair um was it 2014 let me see if i can get a pair i'll see if i got a picture of myself actually wearing them because i remember it has to be 2014 let me see before i move on here i think it's 2014 let's go here you 
got my flicker and see if I got a fit of myself back in the day wearing a pair. I'm pretty sure I do. I'm, I think I'm wearing them with a pair of double tap BDUs. Those were the vibe back in the day. They still probably the vibe still now in it because, um, what you call it, combat pants or whatever they what do you, what do you call them, combat pants? Yeah, they've come back into vogue now at the moment. Everyone's wearing um some form of pants with pockets all over them. So I think I've got a picture. I've got over 260 pictures of fits. That's how you know I was going ham back in the day. So I've got, I think I might have an image of me wearing a pair of 95. See if I can find it. Oh, I've got a pair of me wearing a pair of structures. You want to see that? There we go. Let's see if I can find it. Yep, look at that. Nike Air structures, right? Back in the day, where was that? That was uploaded 2008. OG in the thing, mate. You know what I mean? Representing. Next, let's see if I can get that A95 image of me. See if I can find that one. Cool, you got the pair. Oops, got a pair of structures. See if I can find the other thing. Ba 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 ba. Got a pair of Air Max. Oh, I got this. Let me let me have loads on other tabs and so I'll show you this. This is the situation. This is the vibe back in the day. I wonder how much these are worth. Actually, I got a pair of these two that I'll show you guys here that I wore. See that one? Where's a pair of ninety fives? I have a, a fit. Yeah, there you go. You had a fit of me wearing ninety fives. The fit is a bit shit. Don't get me wrong. It's a little bit weak, so don't laugh at me. But regardless, I've still got a pair. I think that's the last pair of ninety fives I had in my collection that I must have either sold or gave away. I'm not very sure. I've got another fit too. Where? Yeah, let's let's do these two. These are probably good examples of the Air Max ninety five loving back in the day. Oops. So yeah, so there's a image of me here wearing a pair of this must have been two yes, two thousand seven at the uh, Nike offices. I think they're in Carnaby Shoot or something back in the day. So there's me wearing a pair of Air Max ninety fives that I designed on Nike ID, kind of copying the same colorway of the sort of what they call is it Concords or I forgot the name of it, but there's a women's pair of Air Max nineties that came out at the same time as the infrareds, but they don't usually come in men's size. They don't usually come in a size above a UK nine and a half, which is a women's thirteen. So I decided to kind of copy that colorway on ID. Of course, I've got my hundreds jeans on, hundreds and Thunder collab t shirt, uh, Mighty Ducks <laughs> snapback, and some nondescript hoodie. Um, that was a funny one. Then I got the what these Hunter Dunks, right? Yeah, or uh, yeah, half Hunter Dunks. Not Dunkers Bees, I wonder what these are worth now. I don't have them anymore with me, but this is what, 2000 and what? 2007 again? Swag, swag, swag. <laughs> and then there's a picture of me here wearing a pair of 95s for some reason with a Boca Juniors top. I don't know why, don't ask, but that's the vibe. Yeah, doing the corner pose that everyone used to love on the interwebs. <laughs> that's me in 2008. And I guess lastly, another image of me wearing a pair of 95s. The last one is 2008 then, even later. So, so you can see the BDUs. Got my New York thing t-shirt on and the customary rosary. And there's the Air Max 95s. I love them. They're one of my favorite shoes. I can't wait to get another one in 2009. With the vibe, bro. So I can't wait to get another pair, hopefully very soon. So hopefully the, thing, the, the gods shine on me and I'm able to get a pair. So let's see. Let's see. Okay, next, let's get rid of those and let's talk about something else. What else we need to talk about here before I leave you? Oh, boom, boom, boom. Police cord. Got that. Move on there. What else is here? Uh, uh. Yeah, let's play this one. This is really good, though. So, as I mentioned earlier, I've obviously watched the Comedy Store documentary. I thought it was flipping awesome. Um, one of my... Um, yeah, one of one of one of the better things I've watched during the during this Godforsaken year, and also a good sort of um, eye opening account as to uh, it provides more context as to why these comedians in LA seem to go on and on about the comedy store and the role it's played in various people's careers and all that good stuff and um, just the cultural relevancy of it, right? Um, and obviously, you know, things have changed with COVID. Um, obviously, things have changed in California, point blank. Um, whoever's in charge over there doesn't seem to be willing to take any chances with COVID. They've shut major parts of the economy down. They've declared essential workers to be Hollywood actors and supporting staff, but not allowed local businesses to run in any meaningful way. So the comedy scene, for the most part, has essentially been shuttered ever since COVID struck. So people have been struggling to kind of get up on stage in general. So with that and kind of, you know, 
maybe coinciding with you know what's going on politically and whatever it may be and uh, the deal Joe Rogan when he signed the deal with Spotify decided to leave and obviously go to Texas um, you know varying reasons but um, some of the rumours out there were that he wanted to obviously get back on stage again and it wasn't going to happen anytime soon in LA and he's been proven right right he's been able to go on tour with Dave Chappelle and do some stuff at his place where he was I think it was Ohio he had some sort of like summer camp thing that they were doing but he's also spoken in kind of you know um, vague terms about potentially opening up his own club in Texas and we've not really sp- heard him speak about it too much since then but on this recent episode of the Irish Affair Skeptic Kank he kind of divulges a little bit more about what he's going to do um, in Texas with the comedy club and how he intends to sort of set it up and kind of give a bit of background and I guess it's going to and I think in my opinion it's a great idea you know of course he's a how, of course he's one of the you know bigger names in comedy which obviously ex- extremely wealthy and whatever he's doing but i also do think he has this tendency to be a little bit of a spokesperson a little bit more of a man of the people or co- no, a comedians comedian or comedians comedian. he's an advocate for comedians right he's always trying to promote people big them up put them on his platform just generally speak very glowingly about them so i would assume this comedy club would you know it will obviously be a little bit of a selfish indulgence but it will also be an opportunity for him to sort of give back and provide at a place a stage for people to go up and tell jokes and for those people who want to go and see them they can go see them too you know in a state like texas which has been a little bit more relaxed in terms of how they deal with the restrictions it definitely makes a lot of sense let's play the clip and hear what joe rogan has to say regarding it. this is via irish Fears um instagram page boom, boom, boom show with Chappelle last week at Stubbs barbecue in in Austin 400 in people outside yep, 400 people all of them tested no masks regular show packed in yeah how did they get tested how did they do it we tested them before the show oh the, the quick turnaround test yes everybody got there a couple hours early tested outside. everyone takes 15 minutes two people out of 1200 people that dave was there for three days 1200 people only two people tested positive they sent they those left. people home yep and everybody else got to go to the show no mask have a great time it was magic it was magical it was incredible it was like all of a sudden we're back like all of a sudden comedy's back that's what needs to be done and it's going to cost money but it can be done and that's my plan for austin my plan for Austin is to get a club and hire like 10 fucking nurses and test everybody. I love it. I think it's a great idea. And I think it's something that we could definitely see get implemented in clubs. I think the only way a club can operate, you know, in, in any meaningful way is to have some sort of level of testing to allow people to go packed in because there's no way you can do any sort of social distancing clubbing. We already seen the videos of these play graves where people are playing in the middle of deserts with people standing in hula hoops and spaced out and all this sort of nonsense. It's ridiculous, right? Especially earlier on, um, Gerd Jansen unfortunately has been cemented in history as being one of the first people to play a COVID um, restricted party in a perspect box, uh, you know, on a race platform with people standing on spray painted circles, right? Horrendous raving experience so the only way to do it possibly is to have you know these quick turnaround tests people go to a, a, a testing point get tested get the results very quickly and then once they be able to prove that they're negative able to go in a venue as per normal um and that's just just what we're gonna have to do especially with the vaccine in place as well it just makes more more sense um but i'm interested to see what he does with the comedy store how he's gonna able to operate it will it be something that he manages himself will it be something he kind of hires a team to do will he have his face front and center of it or will it be something that he kind of just support like almost supports in the same way that he does on it right he's not in front of he's not on all the commercials on some commercial don't get me wrong but he doesn't really he doesn't really treat it like i don't know how to say it. you know what i mean he's a bit hands off it's a bit like you know at a distance with on it he obviously promotes it like his own company but he still kind of you know um, maintains some level of ob- objectivity to it which kind of helps i guess maybe with his overall image so let's see what happens because you know comedians are weird in it so i wonder if some of them will feel a bit of a way um with him being the guy that's doing this i don't know but i think it's a great idea regardless so hopefully we'll see and hear about that comedy store opening up very very soon um what else to talk about here move on oh this is yeah so talking about that and all this other good stuff let's see here yeah talk about comedy so actually let's jump let's jump let's jump around a bit let's jump around a bit because you know i love jumping so as you guys are aware on this podcast i'm a little bit of a bergen whore bergen bergen i'm a bit of a bergen whore right bergen addict i'm not 
not not pronouncing the name of the club properly but you know i'm obsessed with the club of course um as i'm obsessed with most um dance music venues especially the more um legendary places that have kind of contributed to the overall story and legacy of techno music specifically house disco and all that good stuff i'm obsessed with it watch the documentaries follow the labels artists um watch the live streams all that good stuff i'm a fan i'm a fan i'm a fan and i've also been lucky enough in my time on this um godforsaken planet to be a promoter to be a dj in my own right you know before this pandemic here i was playing in local bars and pubs for you know every other weekend here and there and it was a great time absolutely loved everything about it but you know my kind of tradition yearly tradition that i would kind of always do was kind of a yearly pilgrimage to Berghain in berlin where i sort of book a weekend out of what off from work usually you know thursday to monday friday to monday and essentially you know get myself a nice cushy airbnb and just go ham for those four days in one of the best clubs in the world and um it sort of contributed to my overall um education in dance music and it's also kind of opened my eyes up to you know what can be done in the clubbing space and you know basically uh elevated my um levels of what was that called elevate my taste levels or elevate or something that i'm willing to enjoy because you know we have some great venues in london but we do have some you know rink-a-dink shanky um you know places that probably shouldn't be opened and once you go to a place like burger King, your standards just get elevated there's no way you can kind of accept mediocre nights mediocre sound systems mediocre people mediocre staff you just always kind of expect that high level of course you can't expect it in any other place but that because berlin's a bit of an anomaly even in germany let alone europe let alone the world so you have to take it with a pinch of salt but i always love kind of hearing from the inside in from the inside and people around the scene about what goes on behind the scenes that we don't really know about q we're going to speak about here so this is a podcast called berlin big wigs i just found randomly because i was searching for Berghain on twitter randomly the other day happened to stumble upon this podcast which they released episode three where they speak um to a former Ber, um, Berghain door pick i think that's security or so door staff member who essentially divulges some you know um lesser known things about the club and just generally speaks very glowingly about her time there um so it says the following um this is from Ber- so what is it? berlin big weeks episode three it says in this episode um jill bit jill Bitein, the host, I guess, and Julia um, go clubbing. While well, almost Berghain is the most prolific club in Berlin and one of the most famous techno clubs in the world, bringing ravens and techno lovers to its doors, but not now, but not always through, not not, not oh, but not always through. Okay, cool. Since two thousand four. They wanted to explore just what it was. Uh, it takes place in a special place. Uh, Jill and Julia are joined by Exberg and bouncer Christine, who shares her knowledge and her joy for the club. From a virtual tour of the space and showing what it's like to work in there, to the music, the sex, and the keeping the community safe, Christine gives us an insight into the beautiful underground world of the world's best party. The episode is brought to you by Bear Radio. Da, 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 if you enjoyed, yeah, cool. But again, really excellent web, excellent episode. Um, I love that the fact that she was a bouncer there. She kind of provides a real inside scoop as to how they go about picking and selecting people and i love the point that she made about it's less about exclusion and more so about maintaining whatever sanctity exists inside the Bergheim walls uh, and panorama bar of course and just ensuring the community is kept safe because the great thing about it reading up a bit more over the weekend is that it feels like they went above and beyond the people involved in Berghain to maintain the legacy and the tradition and what they built with snacks, right? The original club. Um, and obviously also the, the parties they should do in other places all around, all around the place, isn't it, right? And they kind of went out their way to make sure that they were first catering to the, you know, the gay scene that they were kind of known for and they kind of way to keep that community of i would say maybe it's expanded now to the lgbtq community keep those guys safe and provide a space for them a safe haven where they can go and essentially let their hair down and have a whale of a time and then anyone else who wants to come into it has to sort of abide by their rules like they're the ones that are sort of wouldn't say they they get priority which is definitely something you don't see in most you know places let alone you know major markets like berlin um where it, i don't know maybe here in london most of the time especially with our clubbing scene or most places right you feel like as long as you got the money you can go where you want that's how you've kind of led to believe but i like the fact that you know it's probably of all the mega clubs in the world and it maybe it's probably one of the f- 
cheapest you know when you kind of equate lineups and whatever it may be <laughs> and drink prices and just how to get around the city it's probably one of the cheapest and it also has a strict strict door policy right it's super random how people get selected to go in and out um she mentions in this podcast actually christine how um they can kind of sniff out the fakers and the fronters which is something very illuminating something that i kind of um long suspected and i think people kind of got a feeling of as well and it makes complete sense i think you know working a place that i'd imagine you know what friday to to, to monday all hours of the day week in week out um, seeing many different people from all different parts of the world you quite quickly become a little bit attuned to how people go because I remember even for myself working in retail you 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 start to understand humans a lot better working in retail working in sort of service industry I think most people would attest right there's very very rarely do you find us a person that works in a service industry as a complete dick or a complete cunt right because they've worked in industries in places where they've kind of had to enjoy dickens and cunts so they're a little bit more you know mellow and i'd imagine working you know at a door like that and being supposed to many different people you kind of pick up things and ticks and little things that people do they don't even realize and you're able to kind of suss out who's here just for the hype and who's here to really kind of get down and you know have a good time and contribute as much as they can and that's the first thing i realized when i went um, I realized that very quickly that um, I was like oh no wonder they make such a big effort with the door because once you get in there everyone kind of just fits there's no one that kind of looks out of place there's no one that's just deaf to be seen it's just people that can again like it's very rare I think the only other time that I can think where it's really like that is when maybe you go to Notting Hill Carnival right where people are just dancing like it's a thing it's a, I don't know it's an odd thing that happens in I guess in most scenes when it gets popular things just you know you you kind of um introduce people in the scene that probably aren't there for the right reasons but it's just a shame that in club music and dance especially when you look back at some of the older videos of nightclubs and stuff and older scenes and you know seminal places and moments in time the first thing you would notice maybe because it's a lack of smartphones but people are dancing people are absolutely losing themselves right and fair enough they're off their tits whatever they may be but they're really going for it and you don't really see that too tough now everyone's you know posing and doing whatever being at the sides you know just kind of you know being a little bit too aware of their surroundings and the thing that's really you know liberating it's just to go in the burger and for the most part see people that you know have probably no business dancing just two stepping their asses off right shaking their head you know taking up their top just going absolutely nuts and again the only ever, other time i've seen that happen is maybe not in your carnival the people really get after it in london like you know it's the, one of the rare times you get to party outdoors you know drink you know crazy amounts smoke a bunch of weed and get up to all sorts of debauchery without the police kind of telling you to go home so people just take advantage of it right great food great music great sound systems um again that's what makes the place special so as annoying as it can be for people that don't get in it honestly is worth it once you do get in because the selecting and the picking again as a, I think as she kind of changed our mind on it Kristen it's like you know it's less about not letting you in and more so about maintaining whoever's in there who's actually is a sort of fabric of that club right because once the hype dies out right the, the kind of the chances and the one star trip advisor people will never go back there again so the people that actually keep the lights on they're making sure that they prioritize them and i thought that was awesome and then it also led me to this other um topic on the techno subreddit which i recommend you check out i think it's called what's it techno was it the, the thing is called go back it's called something uh it's called tell me about your experience at Berghain and everyone's sort of writing their review and how they kind of you know what they kind of got up to obviously in Berghain yeah, standard thing and i guess this person here made a really good point about the whole you know because a lot of people were moaning about not being able to get in and basically saying you know they didn't really have a good time queuing and you know there's better places to go to blah 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 and they made a really good point which kind of echoes what Kristen said in the podcast I said the following um it says um everyone's saying they turn away people for no reason clearly have no clue about the experience of the club and also just how numbers work the club has a capacity of 200 and f what two two thousand five hundred people roughly doubled on new year's, day, new year's day birthday and oscar at night around ten thousand people try to get in every single weekend bearing in mind that if you get the stamp or the wristband now you can come back in and now as please it's not sustainable to let everyone in and i had no idea that the capacity was that low i think chris mentioned in an interview that it's like 1500 i think so that might be i don't know that might be the actual number i don't know but it's somewhere between 1500 and 2500 when you get in there i swear to god right especially the main Bergheim floor it feels like there's like 5000 people in there i don't know why maybe because it's so dark that's the one thing as well it's amazing it's 
pitch but sometimes you go in and it's pitch black and depending on how the the you know the lighting guy is kind of messing around with the stuff but sometimes you go in and it's dark you can't see in front of your hands sometimes right and just the sound is blaring but all you feel are bodies and this kind of swaying motion and you feel like it's you feel like it's ten thousand people in it then you go up to panorama bar and it, you feel as if there's like two thousand people in there too because they're all s- s- tightly squished up you know right up until against the window next to the dj booth just losing their heads so to hear that there's such the capacity isn't as big as it, I thought it would be. And the people that try to get in there are numerous. It really does make you feel a little bit um, grateful that you get in. I'm really chuffed. Like I've only never not got in once. And that was the one time I went with a group of lads, right? We happened to be on a work trip and we went to go into Burka. And embarrassingly, we, we tried to get in first as a group. And they obviously, Sven obviously said, get the fuck out of here. And then f- because we were drunk, we thought it would be smart. We thought we were being clever by um exchanging jackets we change our jackets and then thought we could go in one by one and of course he's like i recognize you just you know what i mean there's not many um groups of five british dudes that look the way you do with the you know different races in a group i remember who you are like go get fucked so we left and i think we ended up going to like cata blue or something like that right but that's the only time i never got in most all the other times i usually was getting because i go on my own i'd usually try and you know time it to go on a sunday when the queues are not as busy and you know maybe it's a bit more chance to get in and whatever it may be right i'm lucky in that respect but i feel even more lucky that the fact that the numbers are really really low capacity wise considering the amount of people i try and get in because sometimes the queue goes way 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 back to the taxi rank sometimes like a spiral back out like you know past where all the taxis are it gets insane anyway he continues he says also as a club gets popular you get more and more posers that want to get in and say they've been in whilst they will whilst they will ruin the safe space that is inside women fully naked guys everything each other in in a line cubicle sessions of 12 people um guy that drinks your here course so letting people by order of arrival is not an option 100 percent agree and that's what she meant um in the podcast it's not about you not getting in it's about maintaining the sanctity of the place and also not freaking people out because i remember one time this is a very poignant moment i think maybe the first time i went there i was just like my eyes were just like open like just wide open i was like oh my god i can't believe i'm in here just like absorbing everything around me just walking around my own just like tripping balls thinking oh my god this is amazing and i remember being on the main dance floor and just like staring at i think it might have been dj harvey playing and unfortunately in my line of sight there was this girl that was dancing in like a bondage thing like a little strap but it just exposed her breast and she just and again i wasn't even looking at her i was just looking at harvey just like thinking wow i'm watch, i'm watching or listening to dj harvey play in the main floor of the burger and he's absolutely he's playing in a way that i'd never thought he'd be he play and like burger right if you know dj harvey he's mostly known as a kind of disco guy so for him to be absolutely rocking that floor just took my breath away so just staring at him my jaw opened and if I think the girl caught my eye and then she kind of got self-conscious and all magically kind of covered up a little bit. And I was like, oh shit, I forgot where I was. I was like, hey, stop staring and at the DJ and dance. Like turn around, turn away from the booth and just do your thing. So that immediately snapped out of it and just started letting loose, took, took my top off. I was just absolutely going for it. And then, you know, whenever I did glance back to the booth, she obviously relaxed too. But it was a kind of understanding of like, hey, this is their space. You're coming into their room, their church, their their building. Um, kind of respected by not being weird, right? And that's when I kind of had to kind of relax and get in, you know, kind of, you know, as you, you know, right? ease myself into it. Once I did, I was like, oh, okay, now I definitely understand what's going on. So that is one of them. And it continues here. The door policy is not to create a false sense of exclusivity. It has always been there because Bergen originated from Snacks, a very decadent gay party that wouldn't have survived had they let in a straight to take over the club scene because it's quote unquote cool. At the end of the day, the door policy is here to protect the people who are inside, but also protect them. Some of the tourists that think they're up for it, but would scream at a fool having a gay guy touch their fight. Exactly. You have to be very comfortable just being around people that you probably don't necessarily be around in your everyday life. And again, I think for the most part, if you're really about this techno life and you know the origins of it, especially European wise and you're just being around things you shouldn't be freaked out about people doing whatever they're doing it's nothing to do with you it's not especially within the dark rooms they're well away from people they're sort of hidden behind curtains it's like you don't need to expose yourself to that if you don't want to enjoy the music have a good time buy a drink have a chat with somebody in the toilet line wherever it may be and just keep it moving um the continuous says unfortunately they have about 10 seconds to decide if you're one not one of them and even if you do um even, and even though you might not be there will be a collateral damage yes you might queue for free hours and risk getting turned away but you know what you're setting it up for when you go of course and that's a great thing i think that's one of the saving graces about berlin in general is that even if you don't get in there's so many clubs just around the area of where Bergheim is right it's a bit of a don't get me wrong it's a little bit it's a little bit out of the way but still 10 minutes 
away from the burger and you can immediately go to Catablua fruit show is around the corner from there um the old grace Mulan used to be not too far from there too and many other you know numerous bars in like a copper saturn all those kind of places so it's not you know you don't have to go too far to go for a night out and have a bit of a boogie so that makes it a lot more easy to take and also you know again it's this exclusive plus isn't it you want to go there because everyone wants to go there so if you can't get in you don't you don't take it too personally but again i'm uh, it's such an amazing podcast i really recommend you check it out it's about an hour i've listened to it a couple times actually of course you know naturally with covid you're sort of reminiscing on the nights of old but definitely check it out um it's called berlin bigwigs it's available on all the podcasts and platforms a podcast by bear radio um with the host julian uh jill and julia um interviewing this uh, former bouncer called Kristen. Recommend you check it out. Definitely um, recommended listening if you're a dance music aficionado like myself. And to end, to end, to end, to end, to end, to end. <laughs> These are the books I'm, of course, you know, COVID times. I'm trying to watch a lot of movies, um, watch some foreign TV series, you know, like Engrenage, Spiral, and all this other good stuff, and Gamora, and all this other series I've watched, but I'm also trying to make sure that I'm maintaining my reading. Um, I've kind of fallen off the wagon a little bit. It's been a bit tough to kind of concentrate and to kind of keep my motivation up, but with these new restrictions now in place and with the realization that we're probably going to be living under this for another year, at best i thought it best to kind of go out and get some books to sort of tickle my beak and get me back on and um, of course i think i've talked about one of the books already um the secret dj i've obviously got book one and fortunately book two came in the other day too it was on pre-order it was out of stock so it was looking like i was only going to get it i think next year but somehow they were able to kind of update the order status and i managed to get this the other day so i'm really looking forward to checking that out um so check out my other video regarding that you can see me talking about the secret dj and then i've got two more that i kind of stumbled upon that i kind of got recommended from i think podcasts and stuff i've got a book called the poverty safari understanding the anger of england's underclass the reason why i bought this i just wanted to again gain understanding of england's underclass and also it was kind of uh prompted by the covid response right the fact that the government sort of like purposely disregarded the concerns of people outside of london especially in the north and i kind of went to understand why that is and understand why people outside of the north have a little bit of a um complex and chip of their shoulder and hatred for the people of course that live in the south especially the mps especially institutions like the house of commons and just understand it just have a bit of an understanding regarding it i'm sure this isn't going to explain everything but it's going to be a little bit more illuminating than some articles on the guardian right so that was that one and then lastly i've got all the kremlin's men this is um in response to the recent poisoning um of that uh journalist who's a kind of uh a, a vladimir putin critic who i think recovered recently and he's been exposing you know the secrets um of the putin regime and i just wanted to understand a little bit more of that fascinating character Vladimir putin i recently saw a video of him speaking english that was hilarious so i went to kind of get a bit of understanding about that this is by mikhaili zagreb i hope that zyga so mikhaili zyga all the kremlin's men again recommended to me on a podcast inside the court of vladimir putin so those are the four books that i have to read during i guess what the next couple of weeks or next three weeks i'll probably be able to get through all these and then again i'll review them as i go on but definitely trying to get away from being on my phone all the time during covid and trying to maintain this because this was really healthy especially when life was normal having you know going out to lunch and spending an hour especially when yeah when i was when it was normal to work in an office you'd spend i would spend the commute there reading lunchtime reading on the way back reading too so I'd, I'd be getting through like six books a month like easy because you're reading at least like four hours a day you know whatever time i had just waiting if i was in the shop in the queue i'll pull out a book so i put it on my phone i was able to tear through books so i want to get back that and just kind of you know explore that side of things and distract myself from uh the scourge of everyday living with some uh entertaining bits of literature so that's what i'm doing going forward that's what i'm doing going forward and um where are we now we're in hour 40 i think that might be in it might was might be a good place to end it there an hour 40 um ba, 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 ba. oh no let's go here uh before we end this end of this so obviously i was talking to you before about you know joe rogan up in his new comedy club and specifically um 
getting inspiration behind it based on the time that he had that he spent with um dave Chappelle, where he hosts these amazing you know little outdoor comedy things where everyone gets i think the outdoor things everyone gets tested and then the indoor no the outdoor things i don't think everyone gets tested. i think the comedians do but regardless he mentioned that he wanted to open up a club and adopt um uh you know rapid testing in order to have people packed indoors and for it to feel like a normal event and i think i've been wondering myself especially with you know these you know the announcement of the vaccine and the lack of real updates and movement concerning event space and you know hospitality industry there needs to be some sort of plan in place experiment trial to have these sort of like quick turnaround test be implemented at a venue um to see if that can work in terms of opening up these places because they can't operate limited capacity it doesn't make any sense just turning on the lights and keeping it you know um, operational for the night is probably going to cost more than having half the people in there um and you can't really do it social distancing because it's just not going to work so the only way to do it is to implement rapid testing and have people come in you know take a test um if they're negative they're able to come in and guess who did it primavera sound one of my favorite festivals and a festival i've been to what two three times now one of the best festivals in europe um easily again one of the maybe uh worthwhile festivals to go to in terms of cost for ticket and what you see right everything from rap to indie to electronic music like they cover the whole premise the whole spectrum of it genres out there actually so this is from enemy it says primavera sound holds successful trial for live music events without social distancing absolutely incredible and of course you've got a picture here of the event itself it's a primavera sound the festival has held a successful trial held last weekend investigating the possibility of holding live music events without social distancing the event dubbed primavera cov nicely put there was organized by the primavera sound alongside the hospital germans trias in barcelona and the fight aids infectious disease foundation at the event on saturday december 12th 1042 people attended a concert with local DJs at the 1,600 capacity um, venue so a little bit less than what they can actually uh, pack in there but again for our first event I'm all good for it and at the event a rapid testing was employed before entry was granted with every attendee needing to return a negative test which was available within 15 minutes amazing so something similar to that you'd see like you know if you'd get a um, what's that thing called? You get an STD test. You can get those places that you can get turn twenty four hour turnaround, all this sort of thing. So that's really cool to see because that's the only way that I envisioned envisage envision yeah a venue to reopen, especially a nightclub or a bar or you know a festival, you know, and this kind of scale. Um, and obviously it's, it's been aided with the de developments with the vaccine but i think sans vaccine the only way to get people packed into any sort of venue in a safe way would, would be to implement rapid testing now of course the danger would be if it's a festival and it's more than a day and people are coming in and out you have to test people every single day so that'll be an issue maybe it's going to cost some money um again you can offset the price of the punters i think there'd be more than enough people willing to pay 30 quid more whatever or one or fee every time you come to the actual part to come to the actual event in order to get a test or you know allow people to maybe take a box so they can get their own sanctioned test from a list of operators where regardless i think it's still a really good option so a quote here says um that was precisely the objective of this study to validate these kinds of tests as an extremely useful tool to be able to carry out any type of event whether musical or not without social distancing said the team behind prima kov and you've got a video here of the nurses i guess um or whoever's um, administering the test in a sort of tent where people are I'm guessing coming in and out which is great too because you don't you don't get any false you know um well no you don't get any invalid um test results because if you do it at home it can kind of get a bit difficult if you don't do it the right way so you've got somebody actually administering the test to it's, um, themselves there which is awesome the new trial from primavera is one of a handful of new techniques being touted to enable return to traditional live music this week it was revealed that legendary london club 100 um the 100 club sorry will pilot a new ventilation system which is another great development next month that aims to wipe out 99 percent um, um, of the dangerous airborne pathogens such as the coronavirus within buildings developed by the british team of engineers scientists and medical experts the prs the pathogen reduction system has been designed to fit into existing systems awesome when it works uh, to scrub out the, the air by using a high intensity uvc oh so i guess trump was right mate remember when he said he, you should uh, insert uvc uv rays to people's bodies he was under something <laughs> the uv light um, to safely inactive 99.9 percent .9 of the uh, dangerous airborne pathogens such as COVID-19, uh, MSRA, 
M M R S A, sorry, measles, TB, and other common flu viruses. Let's pause this annoying these auto videos. Last week, the president of Live Nation, Joe Birch, told said that they felt very good about prospects of additional live music returning next summer. Awesome. Um, especially in the states, they don't really give a shit in it. Um, that would make more sense. Although Glastonbury said that they're a long way off from being able to confirm the twenty one uh, twenty twenty one edition will go ahead after canceling its twenty twenty edition. Prevera Sound plans to return to Barcelona next June. With lineup including the Strokes, Taming Parlor, Gorillas, FK, Twigs, and Tyler Creator. So, looking forward to it, man. I think it'll be difficult for Gas and especially in the UK, considering what's going on now at the moment. I think there's been conversations around the you know the difficulties of securing insurance and stuff with places like Gastonbury, but I guess in Europe where maybe things are different, I'm not too sure. There's an opportunity. So what I said earlier still stands. I think if you do want to go out and party, more than likely next year you're probably gonna to have to book a trip to somewhere in Europe to do that. Whenever stuff settles and people open things up, I think places in Europe would be a bit more open to have these rapid testings open and do whatever they may be done. I'm pretty sure places in, but I'm sure is it Russia. Or maybe it was Ukraine. Maybe one of them, right, was open, and they were, you know, people were playing gigs there for the most part. I know a lot of DJs are now going to places like Mexico and Colombia to go and play because they don't really, you know, care, I guess. And the rules are a bit lax, so things are a bit open up there. And I guess they're willing and happy to welcome these international DJs who they probably won't have a chance to book any other time. Um, but I think, in terms of being sensible, this is probably the best way to go about things, especially with the vaccine. So hopefully, more countries allow you know sexist hospitality to experiment with these um rapid testing so we can get back to some level of normality because i've had enough of watching live streams i could care less and i'm sure you guys are the same but yeah hopefully hopefully soon anyway that's the excellent thing show episode number 214 214214 I'm way ahead now way way ahead if it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube make sure you smash that like button hit subscribe leave me a comment down below and of course if you're listening via the podcast app thank you for tuning in and if you can please share um, download the show and do all that good stuff and of course if you want to um, support the show via Patreon that'll be more than welcome as I told you before you'll get one bonus episode only on Patreon won't be available anywhere else um, available on Patreon this week so make sure you sign up on there it's only one dollar equivalent of one pound to sign up via my Patreon it's at patreon.com which is Agostino you know it's patreon.com forward slash a g o s t i n h o you can find the link in the show notes below so definitely make sure you click on that and get involved and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe peace